Hey, what it do? Welcome to another new episode of Locked on Bucks. On today's show, Giannis Antetokounmpo has continued his spectacular play, but the Milwaukee Bucks ran out of gas in the fourth quarter against the Utah Jazz, losing 123-108. to This West Coast trip has been tough on the Bucks, but we've seen some small ball Bucks rotations in the first young buck to crack Doc's rotation, seemingly. We're going to dig into that and a lot more on today's episode of Locked on Bucks. You are Locked On Bucks, your daily Milwaukee Bucks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Bucks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Camille Davis. You can catch me weekly on the Technical File Podcast, as well as find some of my work over at Cheesehead TV and Pack-A-Day Pod. Joining me is longtime voice of the pod and founder of BrewHoop.com, Frank Madden. We appreciate you for tuning in and we thank you for making Locked On Bucks your first listen every single day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcast as well as on YouTube. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates that you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MBA. Again, that's linkedin.com slash locked on MBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Now, Frank, tonight the Bucks seemed like they were in control. Second night of a back-to-back. They were in Dallas last night. They're in Utah tonight. The game started off well for the Bucks. They go into the third quarter up by or up go into the fourth quarter up by 12. Then that fourth quarter came and they just seemed to run out of gas. The Bucks were outscored by uh 40 to 13 in the fourth quarter. And the Bucs just went cold from the field. It seemed like nothing was going the Bucks' way come the fourth quarter in this game. Yeah, I mean, because we're recording tonight and not yesterday, this will take on a much more negative tone. But we should really <laughs> think of it holistically. Like one of yeah. the signature wins of the season on Saturday night, coming back from 25 down and just blowing the Mavericks off the court in the fourth quarter. And tonight, the reverse, right? Like, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't even know if I can – like, I mean, literally, I, you can't, like, architect a worse quarter of basketball in the NBA. I mean, to be outscored by 27 points, it's, like, inexcusable and not okay. And, you know, you blew a, a chance to win uh, or get a great win, right? I mean, they were controlling this game throughout. Most of the second half was, like, leading 10 to 14 points, and then they just completely let go of the rope. And, um, you know, but, again, the context of it being the second night of the back-to-back, yep. you're missing Brooke, you're missing Chris. Um, and Dame was, you know, a question mark for the game with the ankle injury looked like he tweaked it on a dunk right at the end of the third quarter. And, um, you know, it, it's kind of one of those things It's like, I, I mean, I know everybody wants to get mad after a loss and figure out somebody to be mad about. I mean, I guess we can say like, would have been nice to see, you know, some of the young guys, maybe some, some more than like eight dudes on the second night of the back to back when the team looked really tired. Um, but uh, you know, as far as the guy, the guys who played, I mean, Giannis, 48 points on Saturday night, yeah. 33, and, you know, just the playmaking load, the decision-making for the vast majority of the night, 13 assists, um, you know, like you really couldn't have asked for more. I thought his defense was really good for the vast majority of the night, you know, anchoring the, the you know, a lot of those small ball units. So, <clears throat> um, and Bobby Portis, obviously, who's, been the target of a lot of complaints. Um, you know, he had 27 tonight. And um, again, like nobody was covered in glory in the fourth quarter. And um, pretty much everything got picked apart at that point, And they just couldn't hit the broad side of a barn. So, yeah, I mean, we can be pissed off that they couldn't pull off the two and two nights. They had a great chance to do that. But the flip side is you saw a great effort, great resilience on Saturday night. And you just got kind of the the reverse end of that on on Sunday night with – you know, a team that looked tired playing at, you know, that's not mile high, but it's the kind of the second highest altitude but mm-hmm. building um, in the league. So, I mean, this is, this is, they have a number of these back-to-backs coming up as well. And again, the Bucks have generally been a very good back-to-back team, but tonight it just felt like, you know, again, they needed a 36 minute game, not a 48 minute game. Yeah. Yeah. They just didn't seem to have it tonight. And you mentioned the fact that they pretty much rolled out an eight man rotation throughout this game in the post game doc mentioned, he probably needed to add another guy into the rotation tonight. He said he should have gave, given Robin Lopez uh, some more minutes tonight because the guys just at this point, 
aren't ready to play that type of defense for these types of minutes consistently. Like these are playoff minutes that he's giving guys right now, and they need to kind of work up to that. But to your point as well about Giannis, like I just want to give Giannis his flowers again because this man has been playing outstanding. He was he had 48 points, like you mentioned last night, 20 to 28 from the field. Tonight, he was 11 of 15 from the field, super efficient, uh, looking for a shot, getting buckets, and still able to involve his teammates. 13 assists tonight, and honestly, he could have had like 20 assists, had the Bucks not gone so cold because it was really interesting watching how the Jazz played Giannis. We saw the Bucks last night against the Mavericks roll out uh, a trapping defense where they were making Luka get the ball out of his hands. They were blitzing him. They were coming. He didn't know which way guys were coming. And on the backside, guys were rotating really, really well. Uh, it was making someone else besides Luka beat the Bucks. And tonight, the Jazz pretty much were like, we're running the same. Make somebody else outside of Giannis beat the Bucks tonight. Because as you mentioned, no Chris, no Brooke. Dame was out there. We can talk a little bit more about Dame in the next segment and his performance that we've seen and the ankle tweak and all of that. But uh, Giannis did what he could, and the Jazz were doing everything they could to get the ball out of his hands. He was still able to find ways to score. Uh, and guys were knocking down their shots early. You mentioned Bobby. A.J. Green is somebody who knocked down quite a few shots early on and then got a little cold as the game went on. But, hey, second I have a back-to-back like you mentioned, altitude, really hard to play. But um, I thought Giannis was spectacular. And you could even see him getting frustrated at some points in the end because you could tell he really wanted this game. Like second half of back-to-back, people always say you're at a disadvantage for good reason. Uh, but this was a game where the Bucks were in control through the second, through the third, and the fourth quarter. It just, like I said, see my guys just ran out of gas, a lot of front rimming, uh, tired legs going on there. But Giannis did what he could, and I just want to give him his credit because we mentioned it a couple weeks ago, I believe, that his name should be talked about a little bit more in these MVP conversations with Embiid going out uh, for an extended period of time. We might hear his name more, but just wanted to give Giannis some credit. Yeah, and um, I mean, he's the rock, right? The night tonight, yeah. like Dame, you know, kind of a good example. Obviously, tonight, the injury tough to tell how much that was weighing in on his performance um five out of 18 i mean again it's like the, obviously that's just not good enough like i think you can predict you're probably going to lose on a night where you don't have chris or brooke and dame goes five out of 18 like right. you know Giannis is gonna have to give you 60 <laughs> like or something you know in in theory if you just are told that dame's gonna struggle that much so um so yeah i mean that's the thing Every, night in and night out it's like you know if Giannis scores 27 and shoots 50 percent from the field it's like oh well you that wasn't that wasn't peak Giannis, right? Like that's a that's an off night for him. Um, and this weekend, obviously, it was just kind of underscoring just the the level that that he's at right now. Um, and again, like we saw tonight, him consistently hitting mid range jumpers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, started off really well at the foul line. I think he was nine out of ten at one point. Only hit two of his last five. And again, you know, everything just kind of going against the Bucks, including Giannis free throw shooting, which which has been not great for a little while now. Um, it tailed off a little bit as well, but, uh, overall, I mean, the, the playmaking, what he was doing defensively, um, you just can't say enough about it. And I think again, the same, same is true in Dallas. Um, you know, just his, is the level that he's at in terms of reading defenses. Um, you know, he had a couple passes tonight that were, you know, again, just kind of vintage peak Giannis type, type playmaking. And for a guy his size to be doing this again, this is not, there's no real precedent for a guy who can be his size, dribble, pass, score the way he is. He's he's one of one, and um, you know, like that that play in the I think it was early in the fourth quarter when, um, you know, he went on the break, and I think it was Dunn and Sexton like both just tried to wrap him up in transition. He just kind of powered through them and banked it in for a, for an and one. I mean, what do you what do you do with the guy? And and I think the Jazz defended him probably pretty well, like right for the most part, just sending tons of early doubles and making him have to try to make plays. And um, obviously, for the vast majority of the night, it worked. And as you said, could have had even even more assists. But you know, but it's not like the Bucks shot poorly from three, right? You always were in the second half of back to back that you're just not gonna have legs and and whatever. And they were thirty seven percent, Jazz were thirty nine percent. So the three point line was not like the the huge you know differentiator here. Um, you know, Jazz only had eight fast break points, um, but the tail of the tape in the paint, um, you know, last night Bucks dominated the paint, even though they were small tonight, it felt like, especially over time, you felt the Bucks lack of size with Brooke out mm -hmm. 50 to 30, 
differential in the paint. Obviously, a lot of the Bucks' low paint numbers is driven by the fact that they were pushing the ball out of Giannis's hands um, consistently, and he was having to make hay from mid range and, and kind of do different things. But um, yeah, unfortunately, um, <laughs> you know, and and the offensive rebounding for the for the Jazz as well. That's been something that has been markedly improved since uh, Adrian Griffin's departure was defensive rebounding. And tonight, um, I think the Jazz were like 33% offensive rebound rate, which is, yeah. you know, on the very high end Plus of what 20. you'd want to see. Yeah. So, um, so certainly the second chances, I think, hurt as well and and kept the Jazz in it. And, and ultimately, you know, again, it just felt like um, kind of things just got completely out of hand there in the fourth quarter. And, you know, the crowds was, was in it and the Bucks just kind of folded, um, yeah. you know, felt, felt almost like watching like a young team, even though it's basically kind of more of the reverse. Um, but it felt like the Bucks were just kind of like, you know, if that, if that was not a second back to back, you'd be like, well, well, they, well, that team's just wasn't ready for, for what the jazz came with. Um, and I mean, obviously they weren't right. I mean, minus 27 in one quarter is, is absurd. Yeah. It was basically a flip of the second quarter when the Bucks essentially did the same thing to, uh, to the jazz. Yeah, they were plus 16 in that second quarter. The fourth quarter really sunk them. But we talked, you mentioned the fact that the Bucs were playing small ball this weekend. Of course, without Brooke Lopez, that's going to be a big option for you. Want to take a look at how they were looking with that and how the Jazz posed an interesting dilemma for them with the small ball lineup. And also just talk a little bit more about Dame and his performance that we've seen this weekend up next. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. It gives you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else. LinkedIn does all of that while making the process easy and intuitive. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. LinkedIn is constantly finding ways to make the process easier. They even just launched a feature that helps you write job descriptions, which makes the process even easier and quicker for you. Over 2.5 small businesses use LinkedIn for hiring, and that's no question why, why that is. <laughs> Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MBA. Again, that's locked or linkedin.com slash locked on MBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. This next segment is brought to you by our sponsor, BetterHelp. Sometimes we need the opportunity to get something off of our chest, whether it's big or small, certain things can really start to get to you. So it's important to let it out, especially to someone who's unbiased on your life. So today, I want to say how I really feel about something. You might even be thinking about the same thing this week. And I'm going to tell you how I feel about the Bucks as they approach the trade deadline. I got to see them do something. I got to see this team do something. And it's not to say like, hey, this team is trash or whatever the case may be. But I feel like they just need a little extra juice to get them over that hump, to get them to true championship contention status. But listen, therapy can be different for everyone. Most of us have bigger problems than our favorite sports team and what they should do at the trade deadline. So it's important to get things off of your chest every once in a while. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be flexible and it's suited to your schedule. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOnNBA. We appreciate you for tuning in to Locked on Bucks. A special shout out to those everydayers who tune in Monday through Friday. Got to let y'all know about Locked on Sports today because y'all like what we do here on Locked on Bucks. You can see us plus national shows that cover every league on Locked on Sports today, which brings you 24-7 coverage of the top sports stories every single day. You'll see the Locked on experts on these shows. So like, what are you waiting for? Go to Locked On Sports today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. Bucks small ball lineups. So without Brooke, the Bucks were forced to play some small ball lineups, and I've enjoyed what I've seen in these small sample sizes. Just looking at this weekend in itself, uh, we know Doc mentioned that he wanted to go small earlier on, but foul trouble caused him not to be able to in the game prior to this weekend. But this weekend, no Brooke, a lot of Giannis at the five. 
Jay at the four, even some Chris at the four. And I've enjoyed it. And against Dallas, that's a matchup where you're like, hey, going small really works out here because they were without uh, Lively. So they were smaller as well. But against Utah, a team with a few seven-footers, some size there, it was glaring uh, some of the, the weaknesses of going small against a lineup like that. You saw guards really crashing and trying to get as many boards as they could. But yet and still, like we mentioned, the Bucks were still out-rebounded on the glass. But early returns on the small ball lineups, how are you feeling about them, Frank? I mean, they typically, you know, and when we say small ball, you know, we're talking about lineups with no Bobby, no Brooke, right? Yeah. No, no Robin in this case too. Um, and I think historically returns have generally been pretty good. And look, I mean, I think there's limitations to playing Giannis as, as the five, you know, I don't think you want Giannis playing center against, you know, Jokic or Embiid or something like that, you know, for more than kind of small stretches. Um, there are things you can do certainly on the offensive end to, cause problems when, um, you know, when you have those types of matchups too, but, uh, but I think there's, there's limitations to it. And I think, you know, you see it in a weekend like this. Um, I thought, you know, it enabled them to probably, you know, do the kind of scrambling trapping defense that we saw against Luca. And again, Luca still got his, um, but he's turned for turned it over nine times and the maps turned it over 21 times. So ironically, doing the thing that uh, Adrian Griffin in the summer wanted to do for his turnovers, um, tying a season high last night and then tonight, um, you know, 16 turnovers. And again, I thought, especially in those first three quarters, uh, you know, they were able to force turnovers and, and get the jazz, you know, kind of speed up the jazz at times. Um, only three steals, so it wasn't necessarily all steals. Um, but again, I thought that was part of what the Bucks defense did well was, was forcing turnovers. <clears throat> um but yeah, I mean, I think you look at it, right? I mean, Walker Kessler was plus 22 in, in 27 minutes. You know, I think some, some game plus minus can be deceptive, but I think that does reflect the fact that when he was in, he's, I mean, he's the only kind of big guy who plays like a big guy really on Utah. I think Markin uh, and Olenek cause problems in sort of different ways because they're more perimeter oriented bigs mm -hmm. and it's hard to contest them. You know, they get their shots up, especially Markin in when they're smaller guys on him, he can just shoot over people. Um, but uh, yeah, it just felt like the size kind of became more and more of an issue. We saw the alley over the top. Um, and, you know, again, it's kind of like the first few quarters, I was, I was kind of like amazed at how well the Bucks Dang. were defending. So it's sort of one of those things where it's like, well, I can't, I mean, the, the defensive numbers tonight were bad, but, you know, they defended, I thought, very well for three quarters. So it's like, are we going to, you know, say that like they're all trash now <laughs> because because of one quarter. It's like, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, take your glass half full, half empty, however you want to take it, right? Um, it's late and I'm tired, Camille. So I'm just not gonna I'm just not gonna let this ruin my my weekend. Um, especially after last night and, you know, again, just some of the circumstances of today. But again, I mean, one and three going into Phoenix on Tuesday night. Um you wish you'd had an extra day of rest probably to, to give guys a little more time to, to rest up. But, you know, obviously you expect to have Chris back. Um, certainly hope to have Giannis back. Who, who knows with Dame, right? Like ankles are funny. Guys will kind of play through stuff and then miss a game just because something swells up. So um, it didn't seem like when he tweaked it on that dunk over Kessler, I mean, it didn't seem like there was an obvious like turn of the ankle. Um, so I guess we'll see. And I don't know. I, I don't even recall if that was the same ankle that, uh, that he was actually listed as, it as was. having the issue. It ankle. was. Okay. Yep. So, um, and that's his plant ankle as a, as a righty, right? That's like the, the foot that he's, you know, typically jumping off of when he's driving to the basket. So obviously it's not great. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you're kind of now staring down the barrel of a, a one and four road trip here and then you come back and, you know, it doesn't get a whole lot easier. Um, you get the, the Timberwolves at home on, on Thursday. So, um, you know, that, that is far from a gimme as well. Um, and then you get the Hornets after that at home. Okay. That's nice. But then you get the Nuggets at home, the Heat at home. Um, and then you get to go to Memphis, which probably a good time to go to Memphis these days, but, um, <laughs> you know, we've seen it, right? Like, you know, you, you think you have a, a gimme road game and, uh, not so much And the Bucks, I think at this point, what they're a 500 road team. So, um, you really can't take kind of any of these games for granted. And obviously Utah's, you know, They've they've been much better these last couple months, um, but you know they also hadn't been setting the world on fire of late. I mean they're four and six in their last ten, yeah. so um, sixteen and seven at home. But um, you know this you had this game there, right? This game was there for the taking, in spite of all the the circumstances, and um, you know unfortunately couldn't quite make it a, a two for two weekend. 
Yeah, there are some people I know who are going to point to the referees and say the refs are why the Bucks lost this game, and I can't have they let that a lot go. Energy. Like There's the refs a were not lot good. Of physicality. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it didn't feel like the calls were being called the same on both sides of the ball. But what it boiled down to me was one: I mean, the Bucks went cold in that fourth quarter. You losing a quarter by twenty seven points is going to be hard to overcome. And then we mentioned Dame shooting uh, when he went for that dunk. He got blocked the last time down prior to that when he went up for a layup. And it made me think of this piece I saw about NBA players discussing what it feels like to dunk and if dunking is painful, um, which was a question I always had because the idea of just slamming your hand against a metal rim always seemed like it was painful. And it was interesting hearing older players say, like, as they get older, like, they don't try to dunk as much, but sometimes you're forced to dunk. Because you know if you don't, you're going to get your shot swatted. So seeing Dame come down with the layup, get it swatted, come back down, dunk, and then tweak his ankle uh, was one of those ones where I'm like, yeah, that's – that's that's you, you're getting up there a little bit, Dame. Like, we know you can still hoop and everything like that. But um, it's unfortunate, especially with the slate of games the Bucks have coming up. You mentioned the fact that when they get home, they have the Timberwolves uh, and they have the Hornets. And the Hornets are the second I have a back-to-back for the Bucks there. So they have Minnesota on Thursday, the Hornets on Friday. And it's a lot of basketball coming up. Like the Bucks are going to need that all-star break uh, to come for sure, just to kind of give them some time to, to settle back down, get a little bit healthier. And for Damon in particular, I don't expect him to shoot 91% from the field consistently, like he did against Dallas, that 10 of 11 night was outstanding. He was hitting some crazy shots. I enjoyed that. Don't expect that. That's unrealistic. But him shooting 28% from the field like he did today, 13% from three uh, in the game, especially when you don't have Chris and you don't have Brooke, it's really hard to overcome. So uh, for Dame, I just hope to start seeing just more consistent stat lines from him. Like I think with having a Giannis who we've watched for years and you see him night in and night out be pretty consistent with his scoring output, uh, you can forget how – special that is, uh, especially watching Dame. And it's no slight against Dame. I'm not trying to cast any dispersions upon him, but uh, it's been a lot of up and down play from Dame so far this season with the understanding that he's getting used to a new system, getting comfortable, off-court issues. But looking at it, like it's 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 hard to overcome these types of games. Yeah, and I mean, there was, you know, the story about what kind of what he's been going through. I mean, we've all known – that he's been going through a divorce since the start of the season. And, um, you know, I, I, I can't relate to what it's like to be an NBA basketball player. You know, you're already on the road half the, half the season. And then when you're home, you know, now he's, he's not with his kids. Um, and so it's, it's obviously kind of a, 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 a I'm sure a huge adjustment for him. Um, but you know, and, and now the injury piece on top of that. So, um, yeah, I mean the Bucks are hanging on by a thread to the two seed in the East right now. But I mean, you know, with the Embiid injury, obviously it's going to be hard for Philly to kind of keep pace, um, probably for too much longer. But you've got Cleveland and New York right behind you, so um, you know, uh, you lose on uh, you lose on Tuesday. Um, I think the the Knicks, if they win another game, they're going to be then tied with you in the standings again. You have the tiebreaker against them because of head to head, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this has sort of been like when I think about the um, the kind of push and pull about like sh- should we panic, should we not panic? That's been going on with Bucks fans sort of all year. I think you know the people that were kind of just like eh, like give Adrian Griffin time. Like, why are you guys worried? You know, a lot of that was just I think predicated on the fact that you were just sitting in the two seed like all year right. long, right? And it's just like, well, you know, the prize where we're gonna where we were gonna be even if things went pretty well, um, and we didn't have well, some of these concerns, so what's the problem and it's like okay well now like you just are beginning to see how tenuous you know your position is especially given the fact that you had that really easy schedule and now it's getting more it's difficult tough. now you're having to kind of pay the piper and, and face some of these good teams and you're taking some l's you know and you're losing some games like the portland game that you shouldn't or games that you had chances to win like like this one tonight um so let's just say we should be doubly happy that they I don't want to say stole the Mavericks game, but you know, anytime you come back from 25 points down, mm-hmm. I mean, that's not, that ain't normal. Right. I think, I think the bucks, what was it? 26. They came back from against the Blazers, Portland. which I think, yep. I think that's the biggest comeback in the NBA this season. So um, and 25 is now the second biggest. <laughs> yeah. So they have the two biggest comebacks in the NBA this season. And we can argue, you know, how much of that is like, well, you, you know, don't dig your own grave in the first place, but 
Um, you know, I, I think the Mavericks game was a good example. Like, I mean, what did they start like seven for eight from three? And, you know, I was kind of just saying, I think like they, they, they really were taking the, those, those body blows and kind of like, okay, mm-hmm. hanging for a while. And then they had that big drought and it, you know, got really out of hand, but yeah, I mean, credit to them. Right. I think certainly yeah. we always talk about, you know, in this day and age, obviously no, no lead is safe with the three ball and all that. Um, but, uh, you still have to go out and do it. And it's very tiring to have to engage defensively, especially when you're trapping and running around the court and doing that, which I think in that scenario, you know, it's probably good to be smaller because again, Mm -hmm. you can cover more ground um, than you would if you were playing, you know, a Lopez brother in the middle the entire time. So, um, so I think it worked there. Uh, But again, like to me, I came into the seasons, you know, for me, the Bucks defense is all about pitches, like how many different pitches you have, how many different things you can do. You know, dog was talking about putting in the, trapping or whatever it's like did they really not have any idea of trapping when they had Adrian griffin like it felt like they were playing some pretty aggressive defense at times so um so again like not that you want to overdo that but yeah you are probably want to have the ability to defend as a zone at times you probably need to yeah. be able to do some trapping at times right when one guy is really killing you so um you know we'll see overall the defense has been better since doc or well, since Griff departed, Slat and then Prunty and then now Doc have, have returned. But um, you know, again, I, I always hesitate to kind of get too much into small samples. We're just talking right. seven games now, and they're three and four in those games. You know, so um, it kind of is what it is. But it, it is a bit ironic that the, in the losses, it's really been in many cases not. not you know, tonight was a bit of mixed bag of both. Obviously, everything kind of went bad in the fourth quarter. But you know, it's been the offense actually that has lost them probably more of these games when you look at kind of what's happened. It's been some of the really the, the offensive dry spells that have really hurt them more arguably than, than even the defense. But um, I don't know. Is that progress? I don't know, Camille, uh, but we'll hopefully see. they can, hopefully they can get both of those things clicking at some point and, yeah. uh, and soon. Yeah. We're going to see, we'll keep our eye out on that. And something else to keep an eye on is the fact that we've talked about Dan, we've talked about Giannis. We mentioned that there was no Chris tonight. There's been no Brooke this weekend, but there has been AJ Green. AJ Green has been the first young buck to crack Doc's rotation. And is that a sign of things to come? We'll talk about that next. Happy Super Bowl to all who celebrate from FanDuel, America's number one sport book. If you're like me, Super Bowl Sunday is all about scoring the best seat on the couch, grabbing your favorite football snacks, judging the halftime show. And let me tell y'all right now, If Usher does not sing Superstar, I am going to be disappointed. And if he does sing it, know that I'm in my house singing along with him word for word, bar for bar at a much worse pitch. But (laughs) Super Bowl Sunday is also about placing some super bets. And even though my Packers aren't playing in the Super Bowl this year, this year, FanDuel has so many ways for me and for you to end the season with a win or two or three. So not only can you bet on who will win Super Bowl 58, but FanDuel also has bets Four, which players will score a touchdown, how many points will be scored, and so much more. New customers, if you join today, you will get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports partner of the NFL. Let's talk about AJ Green. AJ Green got in some uh, some playing time against the Mavericks yesterday. Today he also got some some tick. Got some first minute, uh, first quarter minutes this uh, game against the Jazz tonight. And prior to the game, uh, Eric Name posted a question that he had to Doc, just asking him about, "Hey, how have you gone about trying to get to know the young players on the team better, and also figure out how you can use them in game?" And Doc had a really interesting quote that I wanted to read. He said, that's been the most difficult part, honestly. Like, you come in and you know all the vets. Like, hell, we've played against them all. The young guys, half of them I've never seen in my life or even spoken to. And then I'm trying to figure out if they can play. So you watch and what little bit of film and when they played. With AJ, I've watched him shoot. The play goes in every time. So logically, you say, let's throw him on the floor. Against the Mavericks, he had, what, six minutes last night, a plus 16, whatever that was. I mean, even my daughter noticed that, and she was cheering for the Mavs. So, yeah, it was good. Slowly, we'll start using one or two of them for sure. I think one at least can help us. I said that in my first presser, and I think it will be more than one, really, because a couple of them are just completely different guys and we will use them in that way. 
So with AJ getting in and Doc talking about, I'm really learning how these young guys are playing. Do you think that we do start seeing some more of these young guys introduced into the rotation under Doc now? Uh, I am skeptical. Let me say that. Um, Doc keeps saying he's going to need at least one of them. Um, I mean, probably the, the the greatest reason for optimism is just the expectation that, you know, there's going to be injuries and you're going to need to kind of just fill in bodies that way. Um, you know, I think credit to, to AJ, you know, he kind of gave them a spark when they were down on uh, Saturday night and then kind of similar tonight, you know, showed some good understanding with Giannis running handoffs um, and just being that kind of, you know, immediate threat off the catch. Um, even had like some few, a few good defensive possessions, although he eventually yeah. did get conned into a three shot foul against Jordan Clarkson, uh, I think late in the third quarter. Um, so again, I mean, he's, you know, I kind of said this last year when he was often playing ahead of March on Bochamp, like just feels like he, obviously his physical tool set is not what, you know, some of the other young guys have really <laughs> like Andre and Marjan, obviously, um, they're taller, stronger, more athletic. Um, but you know, I think AJ's got generally got a pretty good sense of where he's supposed to be. You know, he is the stereotypical coach's son. Right. So, um, so I think, and again, like if you want to ask him, why is he playing? It's because he makes shots and yeah. that's easy to, easy to understand kind of what that means. And, um, you know, again, he's not a good defender. The on off numbers are horrible, uh, but he at least doesn't, you know, go to the wrong places. And, you know, in some, in some ways for coaches, I think a guy who, you know, gives a good effort and is in the right spots, even if he can't really make an impact, um, at least it doesn't necessarily throw off everything else on your defense. Um, so credit to him, but as we've been saying, I mean, I don't, you know, there's not going to be a set rotation for just 30 straight games. There's going to be injuries. Different guys are going to get chances. Um, but I think certainly, I would say certainly the the trend for Marjan, I think, is a, definitely an obvious negative one. And, um, you know, I think he's certainly probably the top of the list of guys that I could see being traded at the deadline as a sweetener. Because, again, like, you know, it's only year two, but yeah. um, the, the, the shine will come off, you know, former first round picks pretty quickly if, you know, they can't earn minutes or whatever. But, I mean, his numbers this year are not bad, right? I mean, he's oh. shot the ball well. I think he's, for a long time, was had the best, you know, non-off rating of any of the bench guys, which, you know, isn't, isn't saying a whole lot, but I think he was like roughly break even. So, um, so yeah, it's just, uh, it's, it's tough. I mean, that's just the reality of the league. And, you know, if you're not, if you're not on a trajectory where it's obvious how you're going to help the team, then, you know, John Orr has to make a decision. Like, does he cash that in and can he improve the team with, uh, with a move that, that ships AJ out or uh, ships, uh, March on out. So, yeah. um, so we'll see, but I, I don't know. I think I think a night like tonight, they could have really used Andre's defense and energy, just especially the way things were going in the you know in the fourth quarter. But again, like it's not like you're going to dust him off in the fourth quarter and he's going to be a difference. Like it's you know you would have liked to see him earlier, give him a shift in the second quarter, mm -hmm. and then hopefully if he's got something, then then you can do more in the in the fourth quarter. But um, but also the other hard part is you know when they're doubling Giannis, like andre jackson isn't generally the guy that is going to be the problem Absolutely. solver for yeah. that right it's you need shooting and that's obviously he's, he's made threes at a good rate this year but he's obviously not uh, a guy that you look at as a consistent threat yeah i think it's going to be ebbs and flows throughout the season for sure like griff was known to be a player development type of guy uh, and he gave the young guys some ticks some burn doc more a little bit of an old school guy running with the vets and he mentioned part of that is because of him coming in middle of the season going with guys that he knows figuring things out with the young guys uh, as it goes on but one thing that made me laugh and i'll say this and we can get out of here but with uh griff known as the player development guy it's interesting like we've heard the vets talk about how they the team just talk about how they were coached about trapping and understanding and you can see the defense looking better because they're able to understand it a bit better and I, I do wonder uh, if the vets were having a hard time grasping what Griff's system was and how they should be playing, how that must have been for some of the young guys as well um, and their communication. So if they have a better understanding of where they should be, how they should be playing, I do wonder if that ends up getting them at least a few minutes with Doc, under Doc, uh, to see what they can do. But time will tell. Time will tell. And the next time we see the Bucks, it'll be on court on Tuesday evening, 9 p.m. Central Time start against the Phoenix Suns. It is a national TV game, so buckle up. Hopefully the Bucks can end this West Coast road trip going two or five or two or three um, on this five game trip. So that'll do it for us here. 
Uh, make sure again that you go check out Locked On Sports today once you're done with Locked On Bucks. And for Frank and myself, we'll catch you later.